Thanks. So my name is Lisa Gerhardt. I'm also in the data and analytics um, group, working with users, helping them run their data intensive uh, stuff on HPC. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, the file systems at NERSC and uh, go into a little bit about how you would want to manage your data on these file systems and where things would want to be placed. Um, so first we're going to talk a little bit about some best practices for file systems um, and then some, a couple tips for dealing with your data, especially shared data across the groups. Uh, and then really briefly we're going to go into future plans for the file systems here at NERSC. Uh, so I stole this diagram from Steve earlier um, and basically this is, um, you know, this is a diagram of all the systems we have at NERSC um, and I think the message that I want to you to take away from this is that there's a lot of um, hardware and expertise that goes into making sure that we have a lot of high performance um, file systems with good connectivity to our HPC systems. Um, and there's a number of different interconnected file systems. Um, but I really prefer this much more simplified way of thinking about the file systems here at NERSC. Um, and so what you have is sort of a hierarchy of storage here. Um, at the top is the, the most performance stuff, the stuff that responds the most quickly when you're doing I.O. Um, and as you move down this list, um, the performance and response becomes slower and slower. Uh, but also, because performance costs money, the capacity gets larger and larger. So up at the top, you have the fastest response is just to write to memory, right? That's the, you can't beat that. Then after that was our burst, bu burst buffer system, which we'll be hearing a lot more about later, which is very fast. Um, it has a an cumulative I.O. of about 1.8 terabytes per second. Um, but it's also very small. We have only about space for 1.8 petabytes. Um, and then after that, you have the local scratch system. Um, so we have a, local, a scratch that's local to both Cori and Edison. Um, on those systems, you'll always find better performance if you write to the local scratch. So if you're on Edison, write to local Edison scratch. Cori, write to local, local Cori scratch. Um, but Cori scratch is mounted on all systems. <coughs> And Cori Scratch has a cumulative I.O. of about 700 gigabytes per second. Um, so fast, but roughly a factor of two below the burst buffer. Um, and then after that, we have our shared project file system. Um, this is GPFS. It's now called Spectrum Scale. Um, and this is, uh, this is intended for sharing. It's um, for long-term storage. It has a much larger capacity of data that's kept long-term, uh, but it, it comes with a slower, slower I.O. Um, then here at the, the highest capacity layer that we have is our HPSS tape system, the tape archive, about, an, about 130 petabytes um, of space storage there. Um, it's not a performant file system, it's just for long-term storage. Um, uh, what, how, what's the speed that it can be? So it can ingest fairly quickly because there's disk cache in front of it. Um, but uh, once something goes to tape and you're trying to read from tape, you're looking at maybe 100 megabytes, a couple hundred megabytes a second. So it's, it's definitely not something you want to do streaming I.O. off of when you're in a compute job because you'll be spending MPP hours waiting for this tape to retrieve, right? Um, so if you're accessing data here, you want to go through via, like, you want to stage it ahead of time. You could use our X for Q or run something on a logged node before you do any computing. <clears throat> and then down here, sort of in our odd, odd man out, is we have this, um, the global common file system. Um, and what this is intended for, we'll go into this a little further, but this is intended for high performant software installations. So this is where you put your software if you're going to run at scale on the system. So the, the, the first thing that I get asked a lot by users is sort of, where do I put my data, right? I'm going to do some computing. What file system do I put it on? Maybe it's on project, where should I move it? Um, and generally, if you're doing any kind of heavy I.O., any kind of large read-in um, I.O. bound application, um, the burst buffer should be your first choice. Uh, and you can, the burst buffer is basically a layer of extremely fast um, <coughs> and re-RAM, so it's flash storage. It's very quick to access. Um, but it's, it's truly transient. So what you do is at the beginning of your job, you have a directive that says, stage this data to the burst buffer. Then you do all your work on the burst buffer. And at the end, you say, stage this out, take this output data and put it back on scratch. So it's sort of like if any of you have worked on a Linux farm where there's local disk, you can sort of think of it like that. You're writing to local disk and pulling out. Instead, you're writing to this um, super fast burst buffer. Um, 
Yes. To pull the, the data, the, uh, just uh, CP command is high enough? There's a, there's a special specialized command that you can put in there. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't CP. Um, and what, we're going to go into this in more detail a little later. Um, but it's a, it's a batch directive. And you give it the name of the stuff that you want to do. And so then the batch system, before it starts running your job, will stage the data in. And then once that's done, it'll start the computing. So you're not sitting there with 10,000 nodes waiting for this, this data to stage. Um, <coughs> so that, that's if you have like one-off data that you're going to do. If you have, let's say you're going to do some kind of campaign where you're continuously reading the same set of data, um, you can actually get a persistent reservation of, of up to 20 terabytes. You can put the data in there, and that reservation will persist um, across multiple jobs, and you can access it that way. So, and we, you can do up to 20 terabytes on your own. Um, if you need a larger allocation, just open a ticket, and we'll work with you. <coughs> um, and the other cool thing about the burst buffer is that uh, this, the bandwidth scales with the size of the request. Um, and you have different, you have a unique metadata server, so it's much more forgiving to sort of what people typically say is bad I.O., like lots of opens and closes, um, because it's only your metadata server that's responding to you. <coughs> so we've seen uh, a lot of different science codes um, show improvement just by switching. Um, and unfortunately, this is cut off, but basically this is a, something from the Atlas group. Um, and what, what they're seeing here is their bandwidth reading um, and the scratch is down here. And then they switch to the burst buffer and with uh, just a few minor changes, it was roughly a factor of four better. And that's just from the improved hardware. Um, and then you can further go on to really optimize your code to make this much more performant. But a lot of guys get a benefit just by switching. <coughs> so next after the burst buffer um, is scratch. Um, basically this is for uh, data, you don't want to stage into the burst buffer. Maybe you're not reading it in that much. It's not worth the time to interact, to figure out how to interact with the burst buffer. Um, it's, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's too large. You feel like you don't want to stage it in for a single one-off. Um, but uh, Scratch is a luster file system. Um, and basically, the way it works is there's, a, there's a, a couple of metadata servers, and then there's a whole bunch of different data storage um, drives. And you can stripe your file across multiple drives to improve performance. Um, and we have some guidelines for here uh, for how you want to do this. So by default, um, your, your data is striped across only one data storage device. It's called an OST. Um, and that's great for if you're doing like file per process I.O. But if you're doing, like you're reading from one big single shared file, um, you should stripe across the OSTs according to its size. Um, and we actually, you can go to our website and just search for luster striping, and this will bring up a whole page about this. But just to boil it down, this is sort of the commands, the, the rough uh, striping that you should use. Um, so if you're in the neighborhood of like 1 to 10 gigabytes, you should stripe across a handful of OSTs. Uh, but if you're much bigger, then you want to stripe across roughly about 70 OSTs to get optimal performance. <coughs> um, and you can do this. The way you do this is this command LFS, luster file system, get stripe, and the file name, that'll tell you the striping. And if you want to change it, you can set stripe. Um, but if you have an existing file and you want to say, like, let's say it's a 200 gigabyte file in Scratch, and you want to change the striping, you have to set stripe to an empty file, then copy that file into place or into a directory. It doesn't automatically restripe in place. So the other thing to think about for Scratch um, is that we have a limited capacity. If everyone used their quota to their full um, ability, it would be oversubscribed. Um, so what we do is we go through and we purge. Uh, and if you haven't accessed your files in 12 weeks, they're automatically deleted. Um, so this is something to keep in mind. This is Scratch is for data that's being actively computed on. Um, once you're done with your computing, you should move it someplace else, either to project, to HPSS, to your home site. <coughs> so the next file system in the sort of performance hierarchy is the project file system. So this is a shared group file system. So Scratch and Burst Buffer, um, the allocations are on a per user basis. You have a directory that's your name that belongs to you. Um, project, the directories on are, are on a repo basis. So if you're in that repo, you can write to that project directory. 
Um, and it's intended for large data that you're going to need for the next few years. Um, and it's also intended for sharing this, these large data sets across your, your repos. So if you had a big set of input data that all of you guys are crunching on for different analysis, you would put this in project so that everybody can access it. Um, we never delete data from project. Um, we manage this by quotas. So each repo has, by default, a terabyte of space to start with. Um, if you need more space, you can write to us. Uh, there's a quota increase form you can fill out on the website. Um, and, and we'll work with you to see if we can accommodate you. Um, there's also, we have this nice feature uh, in Spectrum Scale where um, we keep snapshots of the file systems for the last seven days. So if you come in today and you accidentally delete this file, you can go to this special dot snapshots file in there and pull this file back out yourself. You don't need to write to us. You can just grab it right then. Um, and then if you create um, a dub 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 directory inside your project directory, um, this will automatically be picked up by our portals and shared. So it's a way for you to share data um, out to the, to the WAN in a, in a really quick, quick uh, very fast way. Um, so after project, we have our HPSS archive. Um, and really, what HPSS for is for is, is for data that you want to keep for a really very long time. This is something like you have a data set from your paper. Um, this is maybe raw data from your experiment that you can't reproduce, um, or some kind of really hard to generate simulation data. Uh, <clears throat> so you should think about when you're, when you're putting stuff into HPSS, how you're going to retrieve it um, and what you would want to do with it. Um, because uh, at its heart, HPSS is tape. Um, when you transfer something in at first, it hits the disk cache. It goes in really quickly. Um, but then over time, it migrates out to our tapes. Um, so when you come back to retrieve it, um, it can take, let's say you transfer in 10,000 files. They all go in together. Those 10,000 files could end up spread across many hundreds of different tapes. You come back and decide you want to get all 10,000 files out. All of a sudden, you have this traffic jam from all these tapes trying to load. Um, so what's better to do is think, hey, if I'm going to get these 10,000 files back, I should bundle them together into one bundle, because I'm going to need them all at once, and then just put the bundle in there. Um, so we have two. Um, so you have HSI, which is this command you can use just to put individual files. And then we have HTAR, which basically works like regular TAR, except that the resulting tarball tar goes directly to HPSS, um, which is really nice when you're trying to bundle up a really large archive because you don't have to have space for the TAR that you're making before you move it into HPSS. Um, and you should, when you're archiving, um, you should just spend a few minutes to think about how you are going to retrieve the data and archive it in the way that you want to get it back. Um, so finally, here's our, our extra guy, Global Common. Uh, basically what this is, is it's for, um, for software stacks. So if you have a, inside your group uh, a shared set of software that you're all going to be using, um, we recommend that you install it on, in your Global Common directory. This is a, each repo has, five minutes, each repo has its own um, shared group directory in Global Common. Um, by default, it comes with a 10 gigabyte quota, but we're pretty flexible about that. Um, and the reason why you want to do this is performance. So this is the startup time of one of our Python benchmarks over time. Um, and you can see this is the time, I forget what concurrency this is, it's like 1,500 nodes or something, 1,500 processes. Um, and here down here, the fastest, you're going to get the fastest performance with Shifter, um, which you'll hear more about later. Um, and then right after that, very close, is Global Comet, right down around about here. Um, and then you have Project and Scratch. Um, and so these C Global Commons mounted read-only, so you can leverage caching on the nodes, so you get much faster startup times and load times if you install your software there. <coughs> so that's sort of the hierarchy of the file systems at NERSC. Um, there are a couple gaps in this system right now. Um, so in project and global common, any kind of shared file system, um, quotas are painful when you hit them. You'll get permission drift where people will put things in that are only readable by themselves. Um, and then migrating between the tiers is painful. Uh, and it's getting harder and harder to find your data as data sizes grow. Um, 
And then our, our project file system is undersized. So let me just. So we've deployed a few tools to start dealing with this. Um, the first one is what we call our data dashboard. This is really aimed at helping people deal with um, when your shared directory hits your quota. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I used to manage a project directory that was 40 terabytes. When we hit our quota, it was like bad news. Everyone had to stop and go through and start archiving things and figure out how much data they had. Uh, and it was really just kind of painful. Um, but anyway, if you go to miners.gov, there's a link right here. It's the data dashboard. Um, and what this will show you is every project directory that you have permission to access should show up on here. Um, I'm in consulting. I see, I see a lot of project directories, so you shouldn't see this many. Uh, but we can scroll down. We'll look at the staff directory, which for historic reasons is called MPCCC. Um, so you can see we're doing okay in quota. We've got about 10 terabytes. We're doing okay in inodes. We're about two thirds full. Um, but if we were full or wanted to clean up, you can go and look at the percentage that's being used by user. I pull this down, and every time I do this, it's always a risky click because I'm often the number one user. And once again, I am the number one user in this um, space. So. Um, you can mouse over, you can see I'm using roughly three terabytes. So if we hit our quota, um, everyone would be looking at me to clean up. Um, and then if I was to come on here and say like, oh gosh, I need to clean up, where do I start? Um, I can get a list of my 10 biggest files on here and my, by directory and by inode um, and just kind of get a good idea of where to start. So this is sort of a useful tool for managing um, at these shared spaces that you have here. Um, so um, future plans, we're looking at re-architecting our, our storage system to try and deal with some of the problems of moving between the tiers. Um, and what we're looking at is, um, you can sort of think of it, right now we have four tiers of storage. We're gonna go down to two. So we're gonna, you can look at it as we're gonna integrate our sort of high performance area. It's gonna become one tightly integrated package. And then our longer term storage is gonna become uh, much more tightly integrated um, community storage. So these, these changes are in the works. You should start to see some of these things maybe hopefully within the year, especially for our <coughs> off platform storage um, and for our, our next uh, NERSC system. So that's all I've got. Um, there's a couple links if you want some further reading. Um, and otherwise, I'll take some any questions if you have them.